Um, who's used Python before? Show of hands. Pretty much loads, loads of people. Um, does everybody have, um, before we get started, does everyone have any Anaconda set up on their computers? Probably the, the quickest way to do this would be to then get either Anaconda prompt if you're on a Windows machine or your terminal if you're on a Mac. And then once you have your, either your Anaconda prompt or your terminal up in front of you, um, we're going to create what's called a virtual environment. So this is something that I do for every new project when I start a Python project. And it's a bit of a sandbox. So it means that everything that you go ahead and you do, all the packages that you um, install, all the work that you do, it only affects what's in this sandbox. It shouldn't affect anything outside of that ecosystem. And the way that we create our virtual environment is using uh, this bit of code here. Oh, it's not highlighted very well on the screen, but the top line one there. So the, com the command is conda create dash dash name. I've named mine, failed it to nailed it, visualization. And then I have set which version of Python I want to use. And I've said 3.9, but you may have a favorite version that you would uh, prefer to use. So this is my terminal on Mac. Um, there's obviously a lot of stuff on there from things I've been doing, so I can just clear that. And then at the top, you can see that I can write conda create name, failed it to nailed it, visualization. And then I want to set my Python to be version 3.9. And then what I've done is I've copy and pasted all of the installs that you will need to do into either your Anaconda terminal or your, sorry, your Conda prompt terminal, or if you're on a Mac, onto your terminal. I've copy and pasted those commands, and you need to run them one by one to install the packages that we're going to use. And, you just put those in and I put those in the Zoom chat. So the next step is that we'll add Matplotlib, like this. Oh, no, we won't, because I'm in my base. So let's cancel that. So once you've got your virtual environment made, we then need to enter the virtual environment. Um, and that's very easy to do. You say conda activate, and then whatever it is that you've called your virtual environment. To nailed it, visualization. And you can, you, what you'll see is on your screen, you will have gone from your base environment to this new sandbox, which is failed it to nail it visualization, which is what I've called it, which is where we're going to do all the work that we're, um, we're going to carry out today. And then need to install each of the packages um, that we will use. So matplotlib. Oh, what have I done wrong? Yeah, so for the, uh, for the matplotlib, it's probably better to just conda install matplotlib like that. Um, you could install them in pip, but because we're using the uh, anaconda in ecosystem for the question that's online, um, it's probably better to do it with conda to keep everything uh, within there. And the reason that we're doing this now, and it wasn't put in the pre-requirements, is because, as you're probably finding, there are all sorts of weird 
weirdness and weird problems that you can bump into whilst uh, trying to get these installed on your computer. So just while everybody's whirring away, I'll, I'll move on. So I've put here sort of why is data visualization important? And we've kind of covered that, I think, today. But I thought a great, um, a great demonstration of why data visualization is important, it's not just to visualize data. The reason that we're using a Jupyter Notebook, which um, when everybody's packages are installed, um, uh, I'll ask you to open up a Jupyter Notebook so that you're in the same environment that I am, is so that you can visualize not just data, but code and text and everything that goes along with it so that you can really, really tell a nice story. And this sort of set of bullet points here, they're a little bit bland, a little bit boring, don't mean anything. And I thought one of the first things to show was by using a Jupyter Notebook, you can actually code in HTML, which I know isn't Python, but you can use your Jupyter Notebook to make things look a little bit prettier so that people understand a little bit more about what you're talking about. Um, and I thought it was a great um, demonstration, even though this looks like a sort of color scheme that a year six might, um, might use. It's a great visualization of how even just doing something simple like that makes it far, far easier to un, uh, understand the text that's there. And so my first bit that I would show you is the code that you write into the markdown in your Jupyter Notebook to center the text and to make the different colors is actually really, really simple. Okay, so if that's still wearing on people's computers, maybe you can just follow along um, on mine so we can get started. Um, but there are, there are many Python plotting packages out there that you can use. Um, as I put a few here, put sort of the top eight here, matplotlib, plotly, seaborn, ggplot, um, altair, bocker, and, and the like. Um, but uh, the one that we're going to go through today is matplotlib. And that's because arguably it is the most used. I think that is definitely an arguable point. Lots of people use um, other ones that are potentially nicer. I, I think I prefer Seaborn. Um, but matplotlib's been around for a long, long time, since I think 2003. It's part of sort of core Python. It, it got developed alongside a lot of the IPython stuff that was going on in the early 2000s. Um, and it's a lot of, and uh, it has pretty much every bit of functionality that you might want, especially when you really dive down into the deep, deepness of it and start hacking away. Uh, but I thought I'd put these here just to, um, uh, just to show uh, some of the other ones there. So to get started with matplotlib, the first thing we need to do is we need to import the library into our Jupyter Notebook. And this means that you want to import all the functionality of a code base that somebody else has written into your notebook so that you can start to use it. And so there's no point reinventing the wheel. If we import matplotlib into our Jupyter Notebook, we can then use very simple commands to do some really quite complex things. And that's because you'll be building, as I say, on the building blocks of code that people have written before you. And so if everybody's got to this point, um, import matplotlib and import numpy. And we'll use numpy just to generate some numbers, which we'll then uh, plot from. And then the next thing we might want to do is set the way that we interact with our plots. And these, these magic commands are quite useful. Because what magic commands allow you to do is change the behavior and functionality of Jupyter Notebook. And they allow you to change the way in which your plots appear. So you actually specify a magic command by using a percentage sign. And you'll see that it comes up as a different color in your notebook when you go to um, plot with it. And if you say the magic command of just matplotlib, it leads to plots that are embedded within the notebook. And if you specify the magic command matplotlib in line, uh, sorry, if you specify the first one, I'll start again, um, matplotlib, what that will do is there will be a pop-up of your plots appear on your computer that are interactive. And if you use the second one, which is matplotlib in line, this will lead to a static image of the plot that's embedded in your notebook. So you have some data, you plot it, 
And using one of these two, you can either get it to be on a pop-up screen or embedded straight in the notebook. And they both have uses. So if you want it to be in a pop-up screen, that allows you to move it around, it allows you to look at it a little bit nicer, it allows it to be interactive. If you have it in line and it's a static image that appears inside your notebook, well, that then allows you to save the notebook as HTML or it allows you to send the notebook to somebody else. And it means that that image of that plot is in your notebook for when you send it to other people. You only need to specify these magic commands once. Um, and it's usually at the top of the work that you're doing. Um, but going through this will play with both, um, just so that you can see the difference in, in functionality. And then one last thing before you get started with visualizing the information you want to visualize is you may want to set the plotting style. And so the matplotlib has lots of different plotting styles, which you can find at uh, this uh, address here, which I will copy and paste into the, um, into the chat. Um, but normally, you wouldn't, there, there is a default plotting style that matplotlib defaults to, um, but it's not always the nicest, and it doesn't always look the most professional. So going on to here and having a look at what different plotting styles there are can help you fine tune the way your plots and visualizations look um, to make them more acceptable to a paper or to a bit of work that you're doing. So I suppose then, once we've got everything sort of set up, we've said how we want the plots to appear um, in our notebook, how we want them to appear visually, um, it's time to, I suppose, actually make um, some plots. And much like uh, the last great talk where we start very simple and a bit of a code along, um, we're going to do some very, very simple plotting that I'm sure you'll be able to follow quite easily, even if you wanted to code along too. And then we'll quickly move to some examples of some more complex plots where I'm not expecting you to code that up immediately. Um, and it's the more complex stuff was obviously where it gets far more interesting. Um, so if you are with me up to this point on the notebook, um, make yourself uh, a list of x values and y values. And that's done in Python by specifying a variable name. Here I've specified x, and here I've specified a variable name f. And you can save a list of numbers to your variable name by encapsulating them in square brackets and separating them with commas. Okay? So here you'll have a list of x values and a, a list of uh, f values or y values, whatever you, whatever you want to call them. So now, with the magic command, I'm going to ask matplotlib to uh, work inline so that it produces all my plots within, statically, within the Jupyter notebook. I'm going to ask it to use the uh, plotting style default, just because. And then to actually create a visualization, because you're building upon the work that other people have done in the background and their code base, it's so, so easy. You literally write the command plt. So that's what we've um, saved our matplotlib namespace as. You call the plotting function or the plotting part of that library. And then you just give it the two arguments, the two values, which is your x and y. And then you, you do the plot.show, and here we have, oh, we're a little bit zoomed in. We have a pretty awful, rubbish-looking graph. However, in three or four lines of code, we've actually got a visualization put on screen. And so it doesn't look great, doesn't tell us anything, but that's really how simple it is when doing it in Python. So just to reiterate that, we've set a list of x values that we would like to plot. We've set a list of y values that we'd like to plot. And then in order to plot them, we just have to run, write two lines of code where we call the plotting part of the matplotlib library. We give it the two arguments x and y, which are our two variables that contain our lists of numbers, and then we ask it to show it to screen. 
Now, if we want to um, change this plot slightly, let's say we don't like the way that it, uh, it looks. It's not easy enough to see where the different data points are. We can change our plotting command to simply include an extra argument that specifies what shape we want the points to be. So in the same plotting command, where we've in, put in our two uh, x and f uh, values for our list of numbers, we can just add a further argument that says uh, we want them to appear as circles on screen. And then I've gone a little bit further here, where I said, actually, I would like to attach labels and a title um, to, to the plots. So we can specify that really easily by just saying, I want to plot dot x label, and I want to call it x, y label, and I want to call it f, and plot dot title to do a simple plot of x versus f. And so you can see that actually the logic and the commands are pretty, pretty similar all the way throughout. We use the same, um, it's, the, it's the same constructs all the way throughout. And the names, of the, um, uh, the names of the parts of the library that we're calling make a lot of sense. You know, you want to change what the X label's called, we just use the X label. Change what the Y label's called, we want to use the Y label. Or change what the title is, and we just call the title function. And here you'll see that the plot is updated, if I zoom out slightly, so that we now have circles where the points are, we have axis labels, and we have a name of our plot. Um, and then just to show that you don't have to just have them as circles, you can have these points as different parts, as x's, and you can change the color of your line to red. Um, we can add in this argument again, just in the plotting function, um, we can add in this argument dash xr, where your points become x's, and the r stands for make my line red. So again, just a very, very simple plot. It's exactly the same. It just shows that we can tune how it looks and how it appears on screen quite easily. And I'll put this second bit of code, this next part of the code, into the chat as well. So they were some very, very simple just line plots. We might then want to move on to doing something a little bit more interesting, um, which is plotting some actual functions or plotting a couple of things onto the same plot. Um, and this is where maybe I'll start just running the commands myself and if everybody follows along, um, because now it's going to be a little bit more code just to get these, uh, these plots running. So if we wanted to plot the function fx equals sine x, we'd have to um, set out the number of points that we wanted to plot over. Um, and we'd have to set up the, um, we'd have to use numpy to um, apply a sine function to our data. But again, it's only a few more lines of code. So we've still set up our x variable. We've still set up our y variable all to have the types of numbers that we want. But then the construct is exactly the same. We still call plot.plot. .plot. We can still set our x label, our y label, and we can still show it to screen. And here we have a nice sine curve that's been uh, displayed on the screen. And in case people would like to do that themselves, I will put that into the chat. And you can see here that we've plotted our sine curve um, onto the screen. You may notice that um, this doesn't really look quite as nice as we might want, because there's spaces at the side. And so in Matplotlib, it's really, really simple to have the plot take up the entirety of the canvas that it's plotted on. And so again, we're just calling something else from the matplotlib library 
and it's called the xlim for x limits. And all I've done here, for those of you that aren't comfortable with Python notation, is I've set the x limits to be my first value and my last value. And so when we plot this and when we show it to screen, you'll see that our plot actually takes up the entire canvas um, that, is, that is shown on the screen. And so that's just an example of actually, not only can you fine tune the line and the data that is shown, but you can also fine tune the canvas around it to make it look however it is that you want to make it look. We can also plot two things to the same canvas. And it's as simple as asking, us, asking Python to plot the first line, which is on line four here, and then to plot the second line, which is line five. And if we run that, you can see that we both get uh, a sine wave and a cos wave. So again, just to show that you don't have to just plot one set of data onto your canvas, you can plot two sets of data, which is quite nice, or as many as you like, um, as many as make sense for the work that you're doing. So that's plotting onto um, lines onto the canvas. I'll move on to um, showing that we can do some other types of plots in Python. And so here is some code that I've written uh, to do a bar chart. Um, and again, there's probably no point everybody code along with this part now, uh, because it requires quite a lot of uh, different, different things going into it. Uh, but essentially, we can set up for our bar chart, we can set up the names that we want and the data that goes in. And using the same matplotlib constructs that we use to plot the line charts, uh, we can create a nice bar chart. So just another way of visualizing your data. And it may well be that we want to tune this even further. So if I come down to here, you can see, you can't, if I, oh, where have we got to? Here, we'd like to tune our data a little bit further by adding more than one set of data to the bar chart. And as I keep saying, the construct's exa exactly the same. We have line six here that plots the bar chart that we've just seen, and line seven here that plots an extra set of data onto the bar chart. And if we run that, we can see that uh, we have two sets of data on our bar chart. So again, not super exciting, but just another type of visualization and another way of getting more than one data, uh, more than one set of data onto your, um, uh, onto your charts. And all the commands that we used for the line charts are almost identical for what we use for the bar charts. You're just calling a different uh, part of the library. So here, you're calling, instead of plot.plot, .plot, so plotting a plot, we are plotting a bar, a bar chart. So then, coming on to uh, maybe something that's a little bit more useful for um, uh, scientific work, uh, plotting histograms. I'll put this code into the chat so that people can copy and paste it. So this is for histograms. And here, we've created a data set. This is just a fake data set. And when creating our histogram, we want to um, set up the canvas that we're going to be plotting on. So we set our figure and our axis, and we want to plot a figure size of 10 by 7. We, this is highly tunable um, to be however big you want your figure to be. And then onto our figure, we just call the hist command. And into this hist, we can put our data set, which is our array of numbers. We can set the bins that we want to bin everything to in the, in the histogram. And it's not a very pretty one. But all of a sudden, in sort of 10 lines of code, we've managed to create something that resembles a histogram. To make this a little bit more interesting, um, we can change the colors around. We can put more bins in there. Um, and we can create something that resembles more of a histogram. 
Um, and I will put this piece of code into the chat so people can see that it uh, it works for themselves. And again, the constructs are exactly the same. We're setting up our data, the number of bins that we want, and the, the patches. And then all we're adding here is we're saying, well, I'd like to change the color. Um, and the command is face color equals green. So it all, it's all very logical in the, the words that you have to type in um, in order to make it work. Coming on to something a little bit more complicated, and this, I'll send out the Jupyter Notebook so that everybody can um, see this for themselves. Um, but what we can actually do is we can highly, highly tune how these histograms look and the colors that we use in them. So all I've done here is I've created a data set. Um, and I've said that I want 10,000 points in this data set, and I want to bin them over 20 bins. So this is just a fake data set that I've created. I've created a distribution to say how those points are distributed, and so how they might come up. Now, obviously, if you're using your own data set, you won't have to do this, because it will have its own points, and it will come with its own type of distribution. But then, it's, once you have that data, it's as simple as creating the histogram by having figure and axis, just like we've seen before. And we want to plot this, but going a little bit uh, deeper so that we can um, tune how this histogram looks, there are ways of setting the axis at the axes and setting the padding between, um, uh, sorry, no, so yeah, so there's a way of uh, setting how you want it to look and how it comes up. What I've said here is I would like to remove the labels that are automatically go into the histogram. On line 28, I've set how much space I want there to be between the labels when they go onto the axes. So again, you see how highly tunable this is. You can say I want X amount of space between the labels that go on. I've said here that I would like to add grid lines to make it easier for the reader to interpret. We can add a watermark if we so choose. And then again, the exact same command to actually create the histogram. But what I actually really wanted to do, and what might be interesting if you have your own data set, is to set a color scheme. Um, and I put this in here, even though it's quite complicated, but just to show that you can, in fact, set, is it going to work? A bespoke color scheme that's based entirely on the data that you put in there. And I know that was an awful lot of code and probably far too much to take in in this, in this session, um, but you will get this Jupyter Notebook, and it is just to show how powerful Python can be that in, well, let's call that 40, 50 lines of code, we've set a bespoke color scheme that is completely reliant upon the data that you've put in. So it makes absolute sense to the reader or to whoever's looking at it so that they can tell, actually, no, this color relates to this part of the, of the distribution and this part of the plot. Um, and we've set it up to have sort of, you know, my watermark and some uh, axis labels and titles. And then just to round off the types of, um, the types of uh, charts and ways that you can put data in. Um, gone back to very, very simple, making a pie chart. Um, again, you just need to set out uh, whatever values you want to put in the pie chart. So you can have food types, and I put percentages. I've specified some colors. I've asked here for, it, uh, for Python to um, explode one section of the pie chart so that it looks a little bit bigger. And if we run that, you can see that it creates quite a nice pie chart, and you can get bits to stick out, um, or indeed not stick out, or you can change the colors. So that's just a very quick rundown of loads of different types of charts and plots that you can do in Python. Uh, now on something probably far, far more interesting, and where everybody might want to start coding, on, co coding along again. But, um, oh no, sorry, no. 
that was what I was going to show you. Uh, just a, one more thing to show that I, I find really interesting. You can create interactive plots. And this is something that I think is really, really cool, especially in a Jupyter Notebook, um, especially when you're making a dashboard. Um, but it's, if you change these sliders, you can create something where the plot changes. And actually, these are so simple to set up because if you Google online, I want to turn my data into, into an interactive plot, um, the top 20 hits on Google will literally talk you through how to do it. Uh, but I thought I'd put it in there just to show that uh, that's quite a cool thing that you, can, uh, that you can manage to do in Python. Um, so on to three-dimensional plots as well. Um, the, this will come and pop out. No, it won't. It's broken for some reason. Uh, We, aha, right, that's where we set it. So there we're creating the contour, and here we are. It's whirring away. Uh, nope doesn't want to have it. But this is an interactive 3D plot, um, or it was going to be. Uh, but it doesn't seem to want to work. And also, it looks like Python uh, wants to crash on my computer. So that's great. OK, that's not going to work. But if any the problem with doing live code longs. But if anybody does want to see that, come and talk to me afterwards, um, and I can talk you through how to get an interactive 3D plot um, up onto, uh, onto your computer. Right, now on something that's going to be super useful for the hacking part of, um, this, of, of today, uh, how to visualize chemistry in your Jupyter Notebook. So the first, first thing that um, you're going to need to do is um, import pandas and RD kit into the notebook. Um, and then the second thing that you're going to need to do is to download the solubility CSV file that I believe is in the Teams. And linked to on the website. And linked to on the website. Um, and it's the solubility extended data set CSV. So once everybody's got that, uh, that data set saved, um, I would put it on your desktop. Um, but you can save it to wherever you want to save it to. Um, we can then use a library called pandas. As you're probably noticing, everything in Python has silly names. Um, but we can use this library called pandas to read that CSV into our Jupyter Notebook. And so the command, you would have to set your variable name. I've called mine the smile set, because we're going to use the smile string from within that, um, uh, within that data set. And the command is pd, so pandas, read CSV. And you'll have to put in, I, this is my file path here on my computer. But you will need to put your own file path in there. And so once you've got that saved onto your desktop and read into Jupyter, I've then, I've then asked, and you don't have to do this, but I've just asked for 10 of the smile strings from that data set. So I've said, from the smile set, I just want the column that has the smile strings. And I just want 10 of those values from the 200th to the 210th index. And I know it says 211 there, but it's always minus 1 when you're slicing things. 
And so if I run that on my machine, just as a sanity check, we can see that these are all the different smile strings that we have um, that I've sliced out of that data set. And then what we might want to do uh, for the hackathon later um, is print them to our screen, so to visualize what some of these chemicals look like. And we do that quite simply by setting up our mol molecule list. So I've got here mole list, and I've set it to be an empty list, so I've made a container for what is to come. And then I want to loop through those smile strings that is in my data set. And I want to call some of the RD kit commands. So we want to first of all set the mole, mole object. And we do that by calling the mole from smiles command from RD kit, which is line five. Once we've done that, we can then append that to the mole list, the empty list that we created. And then we can call this command that draws each of these molecules to the screen in front of us. And if I run this piece of code, we can see that these 10 molecules that we've read in from the CSV file are printed to the screen in front of us. Um, so I'll end it there. Hopefully, you've seen a few ways of visualizing data in Python, um, ending with something probably rather useful for later. Um, where we visualize molecules from a data set um, into the Jupyter Notebook. Um, and if anyone's got any problems getting our DKIT installed onto their computer, I'll come around now.